Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the 18th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2017. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and as meeting papers are provided in a digital format, tablets may be used by members during the course of the meeting. Uh, we have a full house today, no apologies have been received from MSPs and we move to agenda item one which is building, building regulations in Scotland. The evidence session follows up on the session held with stakeholders in the housing and building industry on the 3rd of May 2017 and the committee will take evidence today from Ross Mackay, Convener Property Law Centre Law Society of Scotland, Kenny McKenzie, Royal Institution of Charter Surveyors in Scotland, uh, Gilly Carr, President-elect, Institute of Clerk of Works and Construction, Inspectorate of Great Britain and Glenn Campbell, Building Standards Manager, Highland Council. Uh, thank you everyone for coming along this morning. We, we very much uh, appreciate it uh, and we'll move straight to questions. I wonder if I could perhaps um, open up and just get some general experiences and, and, and views from the witnesses we have today. In your experience, how widespread is the problem of new build homes that have received completion certificates subsequently been found to have significant construction defects? So I wonder if that's a fairly good contextual question to ask given what we're looking at here this morning. Anyone want to... Um, start off on that. Don't all rush to catch my <laughs> attention. Uh, Gilly Carr, did you want to come in? Yeah, um, general, generally UK-wide, it seems to be uh, a foreseen problem, um, mainly from the end users who are the pies, new, new build housing, um, seems to get a lot of negative press. Okay, so your perception is that it's fairly widespread? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay, th th thank you. Anyone else want to Give a view on that. Can I? Can I? Sorry. Well, right. We'll take Mr. Campbell. Then we'll take Mr. McCann. Sorry. Okay. Um, from a Highland perspective, the, the kind of main kind of issues that we tend to, uh, that are that, that kind of get reported to ourselves tend to be su surrounding the kind of noise um, and condensation for some reason, um, and it's uh, it can be a, a kind of an issue where it's down to the kind of quality of workmanship. Um, but mainly, it's in these two particular issues, it's the kind of lifestyle of the, the people that occupy the buildings that kind of tend to generate the, the problems. Specific to new build properties that you're... No, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily need to be, but we tend to find that new build pro people moving into new build properties tend to find problems um, at an earlier stage um, and report them b via the, the Housing Association or the, or the local authority. Um, Thank you. Thank Ms you. Mackay? I would say my experience anecdotally is that there isn't a large scale uh, evidence of major structural defects in new build properties in Scotland um, in the context of breach of regulations. Uh, there are um, a, a wide range of issues which I would class under the snagging heading which can be fairly serious from Nigel's point of view, but technically perhaps not a breach. Um, if there is an area probably which is causing more concern would be the small uh, standalone one-off, two-off type of transaction rather than from major builders uh, who tend to have the, the systems in place to, to monitor and deal with uh, complaints internally uh, before going back respect to local authorities or certainly to solicitors to take some form of action. Okay, thank you. Ms McKenzie? Yeah, I would concur with Ross. I, I think my experience, uh, <clears throat> can I just say, although I'm here representing RICS, I'm not employed by the RICS. I am actually a building standards surveyor who works with City of Edinburgh Council. Uh, I just chair the building control um, pro uh, professional body uh, within the RICS, so that's why they asked me along this morning. Okay, uh, thank you. That's, but, that's but helpful. Just to clarify the situation. But my personal experience is similar to Ross. I think, uh, and also probably Glenn, I think people's aspirations when they build a new house uh, or move into a new house will be, it'll be soundproofed, it'll be wind and water tight and whatever. <clears throat> and there may be a little snagging items, but you do tend to sometimes get the one-off developer who uh, there can sometimes be maybe more serious defects, not common, but can happen. And that developer goes into liquidation <laughs> or disappears, and that becomes quite problematic. And that's where it falls back on your NHBCs, your premiers, uh, your Zurichs, or whoever's doing the, the third-party insurance nowadays. And we'll definitely come back and ask more questions about that 
as the evidence session goes on. So I suppose it then poses the question that um, how can you build homes that suffer from serious construction defects? How can they end up receiving completion certificates? Because if the system's working really robustly, then hopefully that wouldn't happen. So how do we find ourselves in that situation, do you think? It's down to the level of inspection during the build process. Uh, the building control teams um, have their requirements and their diaries for going out to inspecting properties during the course of construction. But stating the obvious, they're not on site on a daily basis. Uh, the Any complete certificate always has the magic phrase, uh, so far as can be ascertained from a visual inspection. So quite literally, if there's anything behind the wall or underneath the floor um, which isn't visible, the building control team can't comment on that. So as solicitors, we rely on the complete certificate as prima facie evidence that the property has been built in accordance with the regulations, but we accept that it's not 100% guarantee. Uh, literally, something could be hidden from sight which no inspector could ascertain. Much so, of it's based on trust? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, anyone else want to comment on that, uh, Gilly Carr? Yeah, um, unlike um, building control, where I'm of the opinion that they only do um, sequential inspections, foundations, damp proof course, windowsill level, etc., where you would normally have a um, clock of works on site, there's, there's a, a quite, quite a lot more time allowed to carry out inspections. Unfortunately, the um, Clockworks have been taken out of the forms of contracts. When design and build contract came in, they literally re removed the word clockworks from the contract. Whereas previously, and hopefully with NEC3, the clockworks is put back in there. So at least it makes the client, the, develop the developer, aware that there is a, such a person as a clockworks. So hopefully we can get back into, back into the construction site. And any other, I mean, just for clarity, I'm delighted to hear replies from all witnesses, but don't feel the need for everyone to reply, so I don't know if Mr. Campbell or Mr. McKenzie want, wants to add anything to, to that. Sorry, yes, of course, Mr. Campbell. Yes. One other thing, um, touching on what Mr. Campbell said regarding um, condensation, for instance, some of that is down, down to design, it's not always down to bad workmanship. Um, touched on modern day, modern day living standards, what people expect, we could put in, not we, designers could put, could put in mechanical ventilation. You know, bathrooms can be improved, yeah, kitchens yeah. can be improved, likewise bedrooms. Thank you. I, I think, Mr McKenzie. The, the, the situation is really, it's a level of inspection that is possible uh, on, on that type of development and resources and finance and the, 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 the matching the application fee against um, how many inspections you could carry out. Also communication, because you're relying on <coughs> the developer informing you that, um, that the building's at such a stage that you can inspect. If you go along to inspect a building, it's all covered up. You've got to have real cause to ask for that to be opened up. You could, you could ask for it to be opened up, but if that was challenged, you would have to almost show failure. So you can only do reasonable inspections. Uh, but if you had a, a reason to think there was a failure, you would get it opened up. I think very, very rarely any building that starts construction won't meet the standards on paper. Uh, and quite often, the final building meets the standards as well on a visual aspect, but it's perhaps these little things where maybe a, cav a cavity's got a wee bit of a block that could cause dampness. Shrinkage, settlement, things like that can happen, but they take years to happen. They don't just happen overnight. Okay, Mr Campbell, do you want to add anything? Uh, I think this, this this issue needs possibly a bit more investigation. In that, is it clear that it's that, that it's building regu regulation defects that are being found, or or is it more down to the kind of quality of workmanship, um, which are two separate uh, kind of entities, uh, and building standards don't, in their inspections on site, have that responsibility to, to inspect the quality of workmanship that's been carried out. Okay. Um, it's, it's for, it's the, the, the reasons for the inspection is to ensure compliance with the regulations. Well, that's helpful because I, I was going to go on and ask a little bit about, about responsibilities, whether you know it's the, the, the construction team on site, whether it's developers, 
whether it's the insurance company, NHBC, um, and we, we had NHBC uh, at our committee a, a, a few weeks ago, and, and I, ha I have to say that, that they came to committee after we heard anecdotal evidence from people who felt they'd been they'd poorly served by, by, by construction standards and new build housing. I, I stress on the record it was anecdotal evidence that we heard, but it let, 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 led us to ask an obvious question about if, if someone complains to NHBC or any other insurance company about a, a significant problem they have structurally defective in their house or whatever, a significant problem they have, uh, whether or not uh, that company would have a responsibility to see if that could potentially be systemic across a 100-unit development or 200-unit development. The reply we got uh, from Malcolm McLeod and NHBC was if the complaint was about an individual property, we would tend to look at that particular property and deal with that complaint because we would not know whether the problem was systematic or systemic. I mean, that's, and, and I'll leave that sitting there. They are but one insurance company, and that, that may be practice in the sector. But back to the concept of whose responsibility is it? After the event, if the new bill properties are insured, and we identify a problem in one new build property on a development, or maybe it's two, three, or four, and there's 200 units there, is there any legal responsibility for anyone to start picking away at this to see if there's something more underlying, whether it's the quality of workmanship, whether it's design, or whatever? Who would have that responsibility? And if no one should have it, should it sit somewhere? Mr. McKay. To me, as a lawyer, <laughs> yes. um, I would say that at the moment there is no responsibility. Uh, there is a, a, a bigger issue here to do with the warranty and consumer protection that a buyer for a new uh, build home obtains. At present, the, what they receive is the habitation certificate, which is maybe not a final complete certificate, but is the green light from local authorities saying that individual house has been passed and is fit for occupation. There will be a cover note from NHBC or equivalent warranty provider saying they've inspected the property and they're satisfied it's fit for occupation. And that's it. Uh, th th there is nothing else there. One of the great omissions is that there is very little obligation on the part of the builder to actually provide a property which is compliant with anything. Um, the, a lot of builders have a standard form contract and they won't even have a provision saying that they undertake to build the house in compliance with applying permission and building regulation. Effectively, you, you take what they give you. And uh, the law site had produced a couple of years ago uh, a standard form contract for use in new build situations. And we wrote in a specific provision saying that the builder undertakes, as I said, to build the house to uh, a proper workmanlike standard, which is the, the classic old fashioned phrase, and in compliance with all relevant regulations. That effectively is the building contract, because normally when you buy a new build house, you don't have a building contract. If you went out and did a £100,000 extension to your house, you would have an architect involved, you would have an architect's contract, a whole ream of paperwork setting out what's going to be done. But on the whole, when a consumer buys a new build property, they don't have a, a building contract other than, at most, that one-line phrase saying, the builder will build a house. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on, on that line of questioning? I think that the, there maybe is a, a, a road to go down and look at something. I would have thought that, and I, keep, I don't want to just quote NHBC, but I would have thought that type of third party insurance should be adequate given the amount of inspections that they do. <clears throat> I think with every product, um, and houses probably fall under that, you might get the Friday afternoon house, I'm not sure. But certainly my experience is not of major problems throughout private sector um, construction, um, not, not at all. But there is the odd one-off house that something has gone wrong with. Uh, they tend not to make the press, they sometimes don't even make building standards, but you hear sort of third hand. Uh, and these things tend to be picked up by the builder because they're a national contractor and they don't want that in the newspapers, they do it more out of their own commercial reasoning as opposed to perhaps any legal reasoning. 
and, and you get the odd house where there's been maybe specialist foundations and something's been missed and that house is settled and people have been evacuated, taken to somewhere, that house has been rebuilt, doesn't need a warrant because it's repair as such um, and something's been done about it. But these are very, very few and far uh, that I'm aware of. Um, uh, certainly and she's able to say it's, it's all anecdotal, but yeah. the yeah. Earth Committee has yeah. it all no, anecdotal. I know, so I know. We, we, um, we but I think well. opening up who, it's who pays for it at the end of the day because Parker Works, yes, definitely, no my experience, uh, if there's a clerk who works on, on a job, the job will be hopefully better finished and constructed, uh, definitely. But that's a cost, uh, and it's who's, who's going to pay for that, and it might end up being the person buying the product will pay, and it starts, it's more on costs. Um, but that's only a personal feeling. Yeah, Gilly Carr? Yeah, um, we seem to be talking about individual properties here rather than it's for a housing association. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get what you pay for, basically. Um, as, a, as a clerk, a practicing clerk of work, so I could just give you a little bit of my background. I'm a joiner by trade, went on to be a site manager, building manager, then moved on to clerk of works. Um, worked for a number of years as, for Newcastle City Council as a clerk of works. And through the institute, we were... Um, taught to be part of the construction team so anything that we pick up building wise throughout the construction phase we bring the build at a very early stage and stops stops defects that we're aware of being built into the properties I, I don't think I've come across anybody who would willingly build a defect into a property and then carry on and do it again so if you can bring it to the um, construction company in early stage it's beneficial to everybody I'm being really disciplined here, uh, Mr. Campbell. We'll bring in a little bit later, but you've brought up lots of themes that I know my fellow committee members want, want to explore further. And we're going to change the order slightly um, just to let my fellow MSPs know, given the lines of question that we've had and the response we've had. Mr. Simpson, can I take you in at this point? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll follow up with you, Mr. Mackay, because we've uh, looked at the, the, the legal situation. You rightly said that uh, people buying a new home um, re really don't have any consumer protection. Um, and that seems to me to be un unacceptable. Um, you mentioned the uh, standard contract that you, you drew up um, a, f a few years ago. I don't know how widespread that's been used, but do you think um, part of the solution may be to have a standardized uh, missive um, that has to be used for all new house sales in Scotland? I think there's certainly merit in that, looking at that approach. Uh, there's always reluctance to impose standard contract by legislation uh, in any field. Uh, but you're quite right, as we discussed before, there is a lack of warranted protection. Um, one, we have to ascertain how deep the problem actually is before introducing a whole legislative raft to support that, and that may require further evidence. But in terms of the standard form of contract, it's increasingly used by smaller builders, shall we say, but the main national builders, we're all aware of them, uh, at the moment still use their own bespoke uh, offer to sell, and uh, they're fairly reluctant to move from that. <laughs> Indeed, some of their position is very much off the line that this is a standard contract, take it or leave it. And uh, we do find that even fairly reasonable technical amendments, in my view, are rejected. The, their view is that's our standard form con contract, sign up to it. Now, when you are uh, a new home buyer, you've seen the house that you really like, it's been sold to you very well, it's got ever mod cons. Yes, you want to sign up to it, and um, the lawyer will try and explain to you the position, but really you just want to sign the dotted line, secure the new house, and start planning where you buy the furniture and the carpets, etc. So I think there is an element there that consumers do require protection in terms of warranty, a very simple warranty. As I said, that builders really have a duty to build in accordance with the regulations and to uh, a reasonable standard. But if we dealt with this in the, uh, at the, the missives stage, that gives people abs absolute legal cover if, if things go wrong. They have that contract, yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, that could cover things like you know, how, how defects are handled, uh, 
provision for dealing with disputes. Um, if we were to have a, an ombudsman, mm -hmm. for example, you know, the, the, there could be an, act, an actual route for consumers to go down that would be set out in those missives, and that doesn't exist at the moment. No, there's not. I mean, I'm sure um, NHBC and Homes for Scotland will would say to you <coughs> that they have created their own consumer code for home buyers, which has certainly over the last few years very much helped the position. NHBC um, are not just primarily a form of insurance, they also provide an arbitration service. Um, and perhaps that's why a lot of these cases don't come to public attention, because when you do have a complaint uh, and you're into a dispute with the builders, the, the, the purpose of NHBC or uh, Primer Guarantee, or the two major suppliers of this product, <coughs> will step in and try and arbitrate between uh, builder and buyer, uh, and only then would the NHBC step in to insist that work is done. Um, but certainly if you're buying from anything without NHBC or Premier Guarantee Protection, you do have a problem if there is a dispute with your builder. So ju just one more final question on this line of questioning, uh, convener. Okay, just, um, just before you ask it, I, I know we're having a conversation understandably with the, the, the lawyer on the panel, but if anyone else wants to come in on that, don't feel obliged to, but get our attention and come in and have a comment. The other thing I, I want to say is that um, I think a lot of the NHBC Premier is driven by the lender, by the mortgage lender, the banks, or, or whoever's lending the money. I think still a lot of, particularly first-time buyers, the person who lives in that house doesn't own it. It's the mortgage person who owns it. A lot of these things are driven more by the lender. Uh, and if people, no, I think it's more people with, with, I don't know how you feel about that, but we hear that a lot of it is the lender wants this or the lender wants that. Um, not in terms of regulations, but in terms of a completion certificate in their hand on a certain date rather than a, a temporary certificate um, because they want to make sure every single thing is complete. We would only issue a temporary certificate or a habitation certificate, as the solicitors like to call them, um, where there's it's basically there's something maybe like a bit of footpaths not finished along the road, a bit of street lighting that may not affect that property and also perhaps as outstanding amendments to plans to be submitted, it might not affect that property, it might affect a, an, another property. But a lot of, of, lot of the third party insurance is driven more by the lenders, I think, than, than the, the house builders wanting it themselves. Okay. If I could just yes. come back on that yeah. point. The, if there is a, a mortgage involved, which obviously applies to the vast majority of cases, uh, the solicitor has to abide by the Council of Mortgage Lenders Handbook, which sets out basically the technical provisions of what we require to do. What that states is that we have to check that there is warranty cover from an approved list um, as approved by the lender. So uh, you will find in that regard, uh, virtually all lenders will say NHBC, Premier, Zurich, will be approved um, as warranty providers. I should say Zurich are no longer in the market, they've come out. Uh, but there are a number of smaller providers which lenders will say, yes, we are happy to accept them as the warranty provider. But provided we check, yes, there is a warranty, that's all the lenders would require. They don't expect us to interrogate the, the workmanship or anything else in that regard. So long as we can say we've got the complete certificate or habitation certificate, call it what you will, and the warranty, the lenders will be happy in that regard. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Or okay, um, yes. you, they, they will accept uh, a chartered surveyor report who's supervised the work or an architect who's also supervised the work as well. So I think speculative housing, if I was to buy a bit of land and build my own house, then I could employ a third party independent, or it may be the architect who did my plans, but they would be fully employed to sign off at different stages that they're satisfied with the work. And uh, I think that's where, from the RICS point of view, and as well as from the Clark Watts point of view, that perhaps third party inspections can be outsourced as opposed to maybe put upon by a nominated third party inspector. And I think a lot of non-domestic, non-housing properties, the architects, still involved in the project, or there's a third party surveyor, a project manager acting on behalf of the client who's overseeing that property at different stages as well. Okay, just yeah. to follow up yes. on that point, Ken is quite right. There is an option of what's called a professional consultant certificate, 
which you tend to see in the, the one-off situation, you're building your own house. Uh, and uh, the professional, um, the architect, the engineer, or a specified list of others can give you a certificate saying, I've supervised that construction during the entire course of construction and everything is fine. And it's a standard certificate which these professionals can provide. And it's actually more wide ranging than the, the basic completion certificate it actually states, I personally have supervised construction and uh, I'm happy to sign off on it. Okay, um, sorry, Crimson. Yeah. If we're going to go down this uh, missives route, if the committee forms a view, I don't know what view the committee will form, but if, if the committee was to conclude that we should have uh, standardised missives, who would instigate that? Would that be a matter for the government? Uh, does it require a change in the law? To make it binding, yes, it would do. Uh, one could certainly, though, as a, an interim step, is recommend to Homes for Scotland that their members move towards a standardisation uh, of contract uh, and see if that can be dealt with on a voluntary basis. Okay. Okay. Um, specifically on this point, Mr Gibson? Yeah, I mean, Obviously, the problem with a voluntary basis is that the rogues are the ones that are least likely to sign up to it, you know? And I think that's that's the issue there. I mean, it, it, it was about NHBC convener because we've had a lot of talk about NHBC. No, 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 specifically on this... On this issue, what, on the about issue. missives. Well, that is the only comment I was wanting to make about the missives, which is basically that unless you legislate, it doesn't cover the people who are least likely to actually adhere to the kind of regulations we want to see. Um, you know, that that were introduced. Right, um, so it's not a supplementary on missives. No, because it was about any. Because when I asked right. for a supplementary, we're talking about NHBC. We've kind of moved on from there. Okay, okay, Elaine Smith. Well, again, it's not about missives. I'm afraid, convener, because. It was a wee while ago that I did yep. want the supplementary, so we're probably going to come back to inspections and clerk of works issues, I think, mm -hmm. later. So I'll shelve my supplementary for later. Could I just ask, though, on the whole legal situation, um, and it was it was actually one of the pieces of anecdotal evidence that we got, that uh, a person who bought a new house in a big new housing scheme uh, from a private building company, had actually got a full survey done. I mean, personally, I was expecting that they might just get a mortgage survey, but they'd actually got a full structural engineering survey done. Um, and then there were problems, foundation problems, etc. Is Is there any onus then on that, that surveyor to be responsible in the law for providing a full structural survey, which later turned out to have huge problems? To Mr Mackay, I suppose. The... Is an, the whole issue of surveys uh, is an interesting one. The members committee will be aware that if you're buying a second-hand property, the seller is at least required to provide a home report uh, in terms of the Housing Scotland Act. Uh, so a seller survey. Uh, there's a specific exemption for new build. So builders do not have to provide any equivalent to a home report uh, in respect of a new build property. It's therefore up to a buyer to decide what level of survey uh, they may wish to obtain on that property. If they're obtaining a, a loan, their lenders will instruct uh, what's called a Scheme 1 mortgage valuation, which is a relatively cursory inspection of the property, uh, confirming it's prima facie uh, four walls and a roof and it's worth X thousand pounds and it's suitable for mortgage purposes but it's not an in-depth survey as you expect it to be. It's primarily for valuation purposes. Uh, the, it is relatively rare, in fact, I would say very rare, for a buyer to spend their own money in getting that upgraded to what is called a home buyer's report, what we call Scheme 2, uh, which is a much more thorough inspection of the, the property. They tend to rely on the fact that it's new build, that they've got the comfort of knowing the builder, perhaps, as a national name, and they take that um, as comfort. They have the completion certificate, they have the NHBC, and they see little point in incurring the cost of a further full survey on the property. Um, that, that's, that's their choice. But I think certainly uh, it, it, there was a strong pushback several years ago in the context of uh, home reports that surveyors were, uh, builders were given that exemption. Okay, I come in briefly again. I think that's really interesting and I'm glad that, that that's come out in your evidence because it might be something that we would like to, if the committee were agreeable to look at that a little bit further. Um, the, the problem with that piece of anecdotal evidence we got was that it was a full structural survey. It wasn't just a valuation survey and it didn't pick up 
the, the major defect. But um, I probably need to just move on slightly. I was wanting to ask Mr McKenzie something on this as well, which was about the fact that when you were responding to these questions, you said that um, often it will be resolved because the, the builders don't want bad press. But is it also the case that the homeowners don't want the bad press because then they might not be able to sell their houses? So therefore, uh -huh, and therefore, is there some kind of need to get statistics that, that actually show the extent of the problem because we're looking at it a wee bit in the dark if builders don't want to talk about foundation problems where half of their houses are sinking and homeowners don't want to talk about that either because it's their houses and it's the biggest purchase they've ever made and they might have to resell it then how, how can we actually get i think you said we should be looking maybe at getting some more evidence but how can you get more evidence this i've, I've not want to get into trouble for bringing the NHBC again, uh, but I, again, that was an, it wasn't anecdotal. I, I, I know of one situation many, many years ago that happened in a property in Edinburgh. Uh, but as I say, I, I think these situations are very few and far between. You may correct that the owner may not want that, that as well, but I'm sure that would have been reported also to the NHBC and probably the NHBC would have been involved. And I think they'll have a record of all minor, major claims and, and defects against them because basically they're just underwritten by an insurance company, I think, these companies. So the insurance company will have records. So I would think statistically the NHBC would be able to give you uh, that record. It's certainly not something that's reportable to the local authorities in any way at all. Uh, and sometimes we only get it anecdotally as, as well. And unfortunately, <sighs> rumours get legs and arms and you know, become exaggerated by the time they get to the 10th person. We might be the 10th person. Um, Should it be then reportable to the local authority? Because it's back to the convener's very first point. If an insurance company were to f find something structurally defective about one house, should there not be some kind of onus on them to go looking to see if it's in the other houses rather than just try to deal and contain that one situation? I don't know if there's... Maybe Glenn might be better speaking on, on behalf of local authorities since I've got an RSS hat on at the moment and not want to pass but but I don't, personally I don't think it should necessarily be because there's, there's no reason for that and no through the building standards. Sorry for butting in. I would, I, I would agree with Kenny um, that in finding a fall in one house in, for example, a, a development of 200, if it were foundations, um, it, it's it would be practically impossible to to revisit those two hundred, you know, the other hundred ninety nine houses, to check or recheck to make sure foundations were, in, in the rest of those cases, uh, done correctly. Can, can I just come back one other point? Uh, the, the problem as well is that you're going back at another stage because where you've got. Um, foundations put in sometimes these foundations may have been put in by a specialist subcontractor on behalf of the builder but in some developments they may have been put in by a specialist subcontractor to someone wanting to develop land in a mining area or whatever who then sells off plots of land and I, I'm only saying that in the moment because I live in Musselburgh and round about Wallaford, Musselburgh for an, about two years someone has been putting grout and stabilising the ground all around that area. But as far as I'm led to believe at the moment, that land hasn't been sold off to house builders. So house builders are going to come onto that land on the understanding that that land is stable. It might just be that there's one wee bit just been missed where a corner of the house goes. It is very, very difficult. And unfortunately, these things may happen very, very rarely, but hopefully that's when the insurance is there to, to pick up any accident that happens in any form of life. You would ask if I want to come back, convener, I suppose, just to make the point that it's, it's, it's difficult to get that information, Mr McKenzie, from, for example, you mentioned NHBC, it would be difficult to get that information because they wouldn't be subject to freedom of information sure. requests. So if they do keep all of that data, uh -huh. then... Um, you know, I'm not sure how, they, how we would go about getting it, to be honest. I don't know how the building authority, being the local authority at the moment, would be able to record all that either. They, they, they could, but again, that might be even worse because solicitors tend to do general property searches 
and anything flies up. This is more second hand, but as a, as a new build we're talking about today is a second hand house year two or so down the, down the road. And if there's notices or anything flags up in that, that will flag up on any property search. So this could be a detrimental thing to the sale of that house or to house builders in the future by marking that against something. But on the other hand, the problem is, and I'm not going to mention the builder, we do have some certain amount of privilege in Parliament, sure, but sure. Uh, we now know that there are a lot of crumbling houses, basically, that were maybe sold as new houses 25, 30 years ago, yeah. um, and, and certain builders have been associated with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think, I think picking up your point about inspecting the whole uh, development, I think the distinction is between workmanship and design. If you find a problem in a specific property and that you'd be ascertained that was due just to poor workmanship. Um, I think that there'd be no reason to logically go to the other houses in development. But if it was a clear design fault uh, for some reason that, um, to do with the design of the roof truss or something like that, then there may be grounds for saying if, if this is a design issue applying to one, it will probably apply to every other house with that same design in the estate. They just clarify like wall ties. Mm -hmm. Like the, the, the school issue. Mm -hmm. So something like that, you think there should be perhaps an onus on um, whoever the insurer are, if they find it in one house, they should then, because that could be a matter of life and death, couldn't it, in certain circumstances? If, if it's design, now that's it, you're getting into technical regulations and literally the nuts and bolts of construction. Uh, if it was a case that wall ties should have been there according to the building warrant and just simply weren't installed, that's workmanship. If it was there on the warrant drawings and pre-approved, and for some reason the engineers got it wrong uh, because they, they weren't strong enough for the wall, uh, that's a design fault. And yes, that, I think, leads into a bigger picture of inspection. Kelly Carr, do you want to come? Yeah, just, um, if we can just step back a, a, a tiny bit. It's um, referring back to the uh, inspection that was done by the engineer on the property of the survey, sorry. Um, again, when surveys are just on the key stages, it's when the, the work going on in between, like the wall ties. If the inspections are carried on throughout the construction process of the building, then you've got more chance to pick it up. Because a, a lot, of, lot of people just look at walls of the building, to nice white walls and timber on it. They don't see what's behind the wall. It's likewise, when, when the structure goes, when, unless he does a, um, a, a break into some, of, of some areas to see what's behind the wall, they would never find it. It was just a general point. Thanks. Now, before we move on, Mr Gibson, your theme of questioning has been returned to us. So now we have an opportunity if you want to explore any of that further before we move on. Yeah, I mean, it was just it was the issue about building control. I mean, NHBC in its submission has said it's an approved inspector for England and Wales where it's been delivering a complete building control service since 1984 and is the single largest building control authority in the, U in the UK and goes on to talk about the services it provides. Uh, but it says that uh, successive Scottish governments have declined to licence NHBC to deliver a building control service in Scotland uh, and therefore um, homeowners in Scotland are, are suffering consumer detriment. Do, does the panel agree with that statement? <laughs> Sorry. I think that the Scottish government or, or you know, the reason NHBC or, or an equivalent uh, an insurance body um, haven't been taken into the, the building standards or building control process, whatever verification process, is that the, the uh, local authorities are accountable to the public, they're accountable to the local members, um, and th th they don't have any commercial um, kind of interest, in, you know, in the unlike. Uh, NHBC, sorry for keep referring back to NHBC, um, but th they are a commercial body. Uh, they're, they're in a business, um, you know, taking fees from cons co contractors uh, or, or development companies. Yeah, okay. okay let's, uh, you put that on the record, Mr. Mm -hmm. Gibson, let Mr. Campbell. Um, continue with no, these I, I, just the, the, the local authority is, is, is seen to be impartial and independent and I think the, the, the kind of view in the past has been that that, that s brings with it um, you know, the, an added security for the, the public interest. 
Okay, so you're saying the system's better here than it is south of the border where they've, well, they've, they've been involved in building control for 33 years? There, there seems to be sorry, evidence that the, the, the approved inspector uh, regime that's in uh, England and Wales isn't as good a system as some people would, would purport it to be. Um, yeah, that, that's interesting. OK, well, Mr McKenzie would like to... Really, all, all I would like to add for that is that I think in, in England and Wales, because obviously RSS got members throughout Britain and UK, and uh, I've got some people I know who work down there, and I think England and Wales, uh, the NHBC, and uh, tend to dominate house new housing, um, and the local authority deal with more than non-domestic situation. But from my own experience in Scotland, um, all the defects, anecdotally, are real that I've been aware of. These properties have either had a Premier or an NHBC certificate. And I can't see where the NHBC or Premier or anybody else would be doing any more wearing both hats than, than what they do at present. So I'm not convinced that um, that's the root cause I'm not saying that the NHBC wouldn't do as equally a good job or otherwise, but I don't think that's getting to the problem that maybe um, Elaine Smith is, is alluding to, perhaps. What faults are there? Where are they? How do we stop them happening in the first place? I, I, think, I think that's a bigger picture. I think that's helpful, Mr McKenzie, and I know we've put it on the record already. I think we should state it again just now. This is not about one warranty provider well, at NHBC. Um, it's I about the... That policy and legislative and statutory landscape in which they operate. Um, so for everyone watching this, I think that's important to point out. We're not looking at any one provider. We're looking at the, the structures within which all providers and others operate. So I think that's helpful that you, you, you come back to, to that point. Now, um, I think it's in our response, have got construction compliance notification plans, which I think was, was brought in after consultation through local authority, through labs as such, local authority building standards. So I think we're at the last committee meeting as well. And that was a step that we've had over the years uh, and, and local authority, different local authorities have dealt with it slightly differently. And we put something formally in place and that's been quite successful. But again, not liking to use the word cowboy builder because that's been another thing that we've looked at over the years for many years to try and how we deal with that situation is that, uh, that you, again, you, you can only deal with the response you get. And as I said earlier, if you turn up for an inspection and the building's finished, you've got to have reasonable cause to strip them. Now, that might, you might say, well, I wanted to see all these. If they've got photographs, that's an alternative method. But again, building standards at the moment under its current remit is only confirming compliance with the, the, the health and safety and welfare and compliance with the plans. Uh, and if there's been bad workmanship that may take 30 years for something to start crumbling, we, we don't know that because materials are changing all the time and they've got third party certification as well, agreement certificates, British standards that comply with independent testing. But where does maintenance come in here? We're in a building here, one of the most complicated and, and beautiful buildings in Scotland. But I think it's had its own problems as, as well. Um, and that's not a dig particularly at anybody, but I think that's just, it's a very difficult situation that we're dealing with. Certainly, very please, we're not conducting an inquiry on investment. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> not at all. M but Mr. but Mr. McKenzie. there's so many excellent things here, but there's probably one or two little issues, I'm sure. And that happens, and that can happen in a lot of buildings because we don't have this crystal ball to know what's going to happen with a material 20 years, 10 years down the road sometimes. I'm delighted you're saying there may only be one or two. Uh, we're, we're, we're happy with that. We might, we might move on. Mr Whiteman, do you want, do you want to come in? Uh, yes, thanks, uh, thanks, Convener. Um, I mean, we've covered an awful lot of ground here, and, and I think many of these issues we'll probably want to return to in the months and years ahead. Um, but I'm just wondering, I mean, to what extent are the problems that we're talking about here specific to the speculative building industry, which I know dominates in the UK, unlike the rest of the Europe, where you enter into contracts at the beginning 
uh, buyers procure buildings and they get built and as an architect and they presumably will be the equivalent of a clerk of works. So you have that control, whereas if you just buy it off the shelf, as it were, which is common, is, I mean, is that responsible for a lot of the potential problems here? Probably at, at the, the core of it, it would be, as you say, it is speculative. Uh, we have a well-established building industry. We have a relatively small number now of national house builders, which we all know. And their job, their business, is to go out to buy land to build houses in the expectation that there is a demand there that people will buy their product. And it's no different from the sale of any other product, be it a, a car, a sofa, a tin of beans, a house. And the issue there is, the, the exp quite frankly, the scale of the expense. You're talking at properties worth, at the very least, tens of thousands, in most cases, hundreds of thousands of pounds. The reliance, a large degree, is on the reputation of the builder. Uh, this is purely anecdotal, uh, but I was at a roundtable meeting chaired by the NHBC uh, a year or so ago. Some of the major builders were represented, and they were at pains to say that they have radically improved and enhanced their aftercare service. Uh, that there was a situation several years ago whereby people were buying property with a lot of snagging problems rather than structural problems. A lot of unhappy buyers, they've they feel that they've now addressed that. They have after-service teams to deal with these issues. And certainly, you know, if you're buying a new property now and you find that there's a, a, a loose window or something, they will get a team in there to fix it. And I think that has squashed a lot of the, the issues. If you're looking at something more serious in terms of structural defects, as I say, the same teams are there to look into that now. And the builders are aware that they have a reputation to maintain. Because you know, if there is bad publicity, uh, it will be picked up by the public, and it will be impacting on their share price, and they are very conscious of that. So they have a business rationale to make sure that they build a good product. But that's a, 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 that's the business driver behind it, rather than a legal, a technical, uh, or regulatory regime. Okay, and, and a question for Gilly Carr. I mean, you. Who, 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 who's using Clarks of Works now in the house building, domestic house building industry? Yeah, but unfortunately, Clark Works have depleted drastically over the past decade or so. Um, I'm not aware of many companies that do actually employ Clark Works who would tend to be a designer or a client rather than the, the construction company themselves. It has become more prominent, and I think it's because of meetings like this that it's been brought to the fore for that there's a need for um, regular inspection best will in the world again on there's a lot very, a lot of very good builders out there unfortunately when it comes to large companies um, they tend to have a lot of self-employed management teams and it's not just the builder's reputation the builder's reputation is based on the self-employed person but if that person's going from one company to another company, it doesn't seem to have much um struggle with the word here. Um and not, not quite continuity, um loyalty to to one particular company. He sees himself as finishing one site and he'll move on elsewhere. So that's where the the the, uh, the overall the large company suffers. But just to be clear, the clerk of works legal obligation is towards the client. Clark of Works works on behalf of a client. Yeah. So would a Clark of Works ever have been involved in speculative volume house building because there is no client at that stage? Not not in the, the not direct at the client. Um, and again, depends on what warranties are wanted, what guarantees are going to be given. You can't you it wouldn't be right to ask a Clark of Works to sign off and complete a building. The whole role of the Clark of Works I see it is to inspect through the whole construction process. Um, Unfortunately, I, I don't work with um, yeah. housing at the moment. I'm on a I work on larger scale, pro, um, larger size uh, projects. I'm currently working for Harry Watt University in west of Edinburgh. And for instance, the piling goes on in jobs. There's a test is done by the main contractor that the piling rig and testing is correct. I'm asked to witness the witness them tests, the offer it up, and it's a build-up build where they've been on site more regular than just the 
ad hoc inspection, you build up a um, good working. Yeah, you, you end up with a good working relationship with the contractor. And it's all about trust, and you can only do that by dealing with 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 people face to face rather than just the you know three or four inspections throughout the, the process. Okay, thanks. I'll leave it there. Can I first of all uh, just thank Alexander Stewart and Jenny Gordus for their patience, who will be taking us on to a new line of questioning shortly, uh, but I know Graham Simpson has some further questions around the Clark of Works. Yeah. Um, so it strikes me that if you have if you had a Clark of Works on on site, um, then that that their job, as you've described, Mr. Carr, is to inspect um, every building, every stage, and make sure things have been done properly. The system we have at the moment, that that does not happen. Um, the building control system we have at the moment, that isn't happening. We have what's called reasonable inquiry, where building control officers are uh, in, inspecting some sites. Um, they're doing a risk, a paper-based risk assessment, um, and things are, things get missed. So my question to you, Mr. Carr, and others is. Should we bring in a system where we have a mandatory clerk of works, for instance, on sites over a certain size? And would that help? In answer to that, yes, it would be ideal. Um, unfortunately, because of restraints on local authorities, I don't know if that's affordable. Um, as you know, a lot of local authorities have outsourced their housing, housing stock to um, housing associations. So it, it would be great to get that in place but clock works isn't the be-end-end end all. We can only inspect on the lot of time that we've been given to each project. It, you know, it's, it's not a, a finite line saying there's a clock works on the job, everything's, everything's perfect. There's the odd thing gets overlooked. Ho hopefully, I've not, I don't think I've ever overlooked anything myself, and I can only answer that for myself and other qualified clock of works. Um, you'd pick up a lot more than what you'd miss. Mr. Campbell, just yeah. come back in. We don't. I'm not. We don't want to confuse reasonable inquiry with the role of the clerk of works. The, the role of building standards, building control, is there to ensure that the building that's been constructed has been comply has been built in accordance with the approved drawings and complies with the regulations. The role of the clerk of works is there to, to check the quality of the work that's going on site and that the building's been built in accordance with the plans and specification. There are two different roles between building standards and uh, the role of the clerk of works. Standards is going to be our final line of questioning, so <laughs> we, 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 get, we definitely get the distinction. Right. So any yeah. other comments in relation to clerk of works? And I, I would I, say yeah. it boils down to risk-benefit analysis. There, there's no doubt that in an ideal world, every house would have a regular inspection regime by an independent professional, be it a clerk of works, an architect, a local authority, an inspector, whoever. But that's going to cost serious money. And the practical aspect has to be where does the building uh, industry, uh, this, this committee, uh, the local authorities feel that there's an appropriate balance to be struck in that regard. Uh, it boils down to cost and what is the risk-benefit analysis, dare I say it, behind it. The, from the builder's perspective, I'm not speaking for them, but I can imagine their reaction to employing uh, a regime of Clark and Works equivalent is it's, it's cost. That will bite into their profit margin. They may want to then put the price of houses up, which is not, I expect, what the, the intention is. So is there another mechanism for ensuring the quality, because uh, that's what we're talking about, the quality of the build, uh, do, doing that and secondly what is the fallback when that quality doesn't materialize and it may be for example uh, something like some form of you know a sinking fund wh which perhaps you know builders or other parties could pay into uh, if you f buy a flat in a modern block these days it's quite common that factors or managing agents will seek a monthly payment from the owners to go into a sinking fund to deal with future maintenance it may be some sort of fund like that to deal with, which I think is still a fairly rare case of serious structural defect, not picked up by builders, not picked up by insurance, just slip through the net. 
that if there is some sort of fund there to deal with these cases, that might be an appropriate mechanism, uh, rather than you know statutory employment of third parties. Okay, Mr. Uh, yes, Gilly Carr. Very, very briefly. Yes. Um, I touched on the qualified clerk works and like and likes the RICS as a legal gentleman. There's a lot of clock of works out there. Just pick up the phone, pick up the business card. I am a clock of works. I can only answer for the qualified clock of works. We'll go through a very simple process to in interview people that come into the institute. Thank you, that's helpful. Do you want to add anything, Mr. Simpson? Not a clock of works, but. Um, so hold that thought, because then yeah. Lane Smith's got a question on clock of works. Okay. okay, thanks very much, convener. So uh, we've got two clock of works situations here. We've got the one whereby big building companies and the good ones, I suppose, whose houses are not crumbling 30 years later, did just to employ clerk of works. They wouldn't, they wouldn't have undertook a, a building project of any magnitude without having a clerk of works, but now it seems they don't. So that's the private sector and whether or not there's any motivation for them to employ clerk of works. And then there's the issue around the, the public sector building control whether or not they should be employing clerk of work. So can I ask on the, the private sector, um, it, for example, what, what would be the motivation for them to employ clerk of works? Would it be that if there was a more um, robust inspection regime, for example, say there was a blue sky team from the Scottish Government who were going to go out and swoop down on particular sites, maybe take the local authority people with them at the time, but the, the, the big companies who are producing these big housing schemes don't exactly know when that blue sky team might be coming. Would that be something that might motivate them around to thinking, well, if we had a clerk of works on site, we would be ready for that? So that would be question number one. Is there any merit in that kind of thing? I see Gilly Carr nodding. Yeah, yeah it, um, I think any additional inspections is, would be of benefit one way or the other. Um, but... But if, if, you, if you're just going to do um, ad hoc inspections, I'm, I'm at risk of repeating myself here again. You're only, you're only taking it at that point in time. You know, do you take it when it's a rainy day, when people are you know, travelling through mud to get to the place of work and it's, you, know, you don't know what's built in there or what's going off the feet, etc. Do you, do you, you, know, you take, take on board the health and safety issues like so? Let's get to the bottom of why the big building companies, the big house builders, because we heard evidence previously that the clerk of works is a thing of the past and, and why is that, you know? Why is it not in their interest, especially when they're employing so many subbies, as we've had some discussion about? Why is it not in their interest then to have an overall clerk of works on their building sites? Is it because there isn't any possibility of um, that kind of unexpected inspection? I suppose that's all I'm asking. Is, is that an issue? Yeah, sorry, you um, You're dead right. There has been some very few um, companies lately advertising for clock of works work direct for the for the building company rather than work for the client and um, so you know it's because of publicity that when things go wrong unfortunately everybody says why wasn't the clock of works it's after the event so it, it is it is improving very slowly where the clock of works have come back in, into it um okay, thanks can i ask mr campbell specifically on the local authority situation so it would seem now that um to, to put in place the building regs, you've got your building control officers. But again, local authorities used to have clerk of works too because they could do a different job to the building control officers. Could you maybe tell us why the local authorities no longer have specifically clerk of works? So, for example, things like, um, I suppose I'm talking about shear tests, drain tests, found tests, the kind of things that clerk of works might have actually gone out from the local authority to do, which is totally different to the role of the building control officer who is more... Uh, well, higher qualified in a different sort of way. Could you tell us a bit about that? Again, if we're talking about the the build housing developments, the the local authority would have employed their own clerk of works for building how you know the housing developments for council use. The 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 private sector is is a different scenario where the local authority isn't responsible for that development of houses uh, you know because they're again getting, getting back to, to to what ross had said initially that in a housing development uh, the, the customer is that young couple 
that's got you know built buying a house for the first time, it's they're the client effectively, n not the local authority. And in an ideal world, it should be you know it, it should be them that's employing the clerk of works to supervise the construction of that house for you know for their own purpose, uh, for their p private interest. The local authority's interest is is more uh, as a wider uh, responsibility, um, where they're they're looking at the the overall development of a housing development, but not for the purposes of quality of an individual house for the end user. Uh, if so you you would never, as a local authority, have used your own building control officers to go out and do. Um, soil tests or found tests or drain tests or then before you gave a certificate of completion, you would never have done that? No, we would. Right. The, the, the system now that, that, that Kenny had mentioned, and I think the, the, the previous meeting that you had where the, the, um, the chart from labs had been here, um, there was probably mention of the com construction compliance notification plan, CCNPs. That's a, that's a, a, a system that's now in place where when the surveyor, our, the, the building standard surveyor, building control officer, whatever you want to call them, um, assesses a, a proposed housing development, given that this is where you know we've got the, the biggest issues with, will sit down and look at a, a scheme of, let's say, 100 houses. They will determine what houses within that development will, rec will need specific inspections, and they will randomly select a house because we don't have the resource to be on site every day of the week or to inspect every individual house. So we will randomly select a number of sp specific house types to inspect. The construction compliance notification plan will stipulate that the foundations need to be inspected on that, on that house, that the, the, it, it might need inspe another inspection at wall plate level, at whenever the, the timber frame is erected, if it's a timber framed house, depend, depending on the type of construction, um, th there will be a, a, a stated number of site visits that we would like to see. And it could be soil tests before you know the, uh, the, the foundations are, are, are laid. In Highland, we fortunately don't tend to have the same ground condition issues that the Central Belt have. Uh, we don't have mining areas that, that you know that that are susceptible to you know uh, holes appearing. The ground conditions in Highland are generally very good, sandy gravel. We don't tend to come across and not very many, if any, um, issues with subsidence or foundation failure. Uh, we they have occurred uh, where people have maybe built in peat, but by and large, it's not a common. Occurrence. Mr. Campbell, is it a resource issue then? Would you have both building control officers and clerical works going out and doing more inspections of specific types if you had more resources? In an ideal world, yes, we, we, we would like to have to, to inspect every single house in a in a housing development, but we don't have the resource to do that. Mr. Stewart's been waiting for an hour now to ask a very similar question, but Gilly, Gilly Carr did actually want to come in in relation to Clark Works yeah, yeah. at local authority level. Again, again very quickly, I, I, work, I worked for the Newcastle City Council, as I said, um, for some 10 years, and one of the reasons I left was they went from a, a group of 14 Clark Works down to two. You can't deliver, deliver the same serv service without the people. And just to um, touch on the the mention there of the individual buying the house, you know, fees being passed to them, etc. As Mr. McKenzie said early on, the pressure could be put under the um, mortgage lenders. I think you'd have a better recourse to get some response from the uh, builder. Can I just check about how much the Clark of Works would, would cost in reality if there's a large, probably the private sector here, if there's a large house developer building a 400 unit development, uh, they're going to be on site a rolling program of build for say two and a half years. Um, how many clerk works would they need full time to do that job? Um, that's a, a very broad question. As such, I, I, know, I, I suppose what I'm trying to get is yeah. if you're selling pro properties at two hundred thousand pounds a property, um, 
you've got three, four hundred of those units, you're on and off site within three years, how many clerk what percentage of the overall ticket price of that poor property sale is really going to be reflected in having two full time clerk of works on site? I'm it's Mr Mackay's reasonable point about it's about striking a balance over level of risk, guaranteeing quality and what the cost to all of that is in that mix. So I'm really trying to just grapple with how significant of additional cost would it be for the private sector to to employ a clerk of works or two or three for a large substantial housing development. We're very cheap. Um, <laughs> clerk of works, are, in my opinion, a lot of them are, are very much underpaid. Um, I'm aware of some local authorities pay as little as £23,000 a year. So, you know, it's not much more than a building labourer. Again, if you, if you get a, a qualified clerk of works, um, private practice in the region of £25-£30 an hour. So, that's, again, that's given a very broad answer to a very broad question. <laughs> oh, no, no, I think that gives us some, some, some context, because we as a committee have to strike a balance in the recommendations that we make. And certainly my, my instinct was just within the private sector, with quite eye-watering ticket prices and a lot of new build properties, it seems very, very minimal the additional cost to a developer for for, clar for for clerk of works. And I was just trying to make sure that I was I was going along the right lines in terms of that, Mr Carr. Yeah, the most recent I've seen from the private sector, direct from builders, has been in the region of £38,000 a year for clerk of works. OK, that's it, Mr McKenzie. Can I just come in just as an alternative to Clark Works? I know that chartered surveyors provide this service as well, as do architects and probably structural engineers, and, and it, it come, sometimes needs a relevant expertise. Um, I don't want to digress, but a lot of instances now when you talk about drain testing uh, on building sites, we, we still witness drain tests and such like, but a lot of that's self-certified now. Snippet, who are Scottish in Northern Ireland Plumbing Association or something, um, they they register their, their uh, drainage people, plumbers, whoever, to cert self-certified drainage now. So a lot of that's self-certified work. Uh, a lot of design is self-certified now through government, no structural engineering registration scheme, which is through your building standards division. That's one of their self-certified groups. So a lot of design now is self-certified, as is a lot of um, site works as well. Um, but definitely a clerk of works on a wimpy site. I don't know if I've seen it, other than if they're working for a, someone else. Uh, I've never seen them employ one themselves, let's say. Okay. Other building firms are Other building firms, and it's Taylor Wimpy uh, anyway. <laughs> Billy, do you want to add that for yeah, me? Um, just like that, again, add what Mr McKenzie said. If there's a, through personal experience, if there's a building control officer on site, you, I, I would regularly see them um, inspecting main drains. And if I see that, I don't inspect the main drains. I, you know, I, I trust them but on the whole. We, we do the internal drainage, what's under the foundation that it's very difficult to get back to test them as we go along but we also get a um, cctv survey of the full drainage system on completion so it's not it's not a waste of time having building control and the clock works when you work hand in hand it, you know it's not it's not um, doubling up on the workload as such we, we tend to go do one thing as a team sorry and, and the third party inspectors as well because what tends to happen uh, is that you know, Glenn's maybe management now, he's probably been a foot soldier in the past, but uh, generally in a new housing development, you will go out at the very beginning, you will inspect the first house going up. Now, if that's a show house, they usually try and make it good anyway, but you inspect that first house, and I think, uh, as Gilly alluded to as well, that, that you, you hope that you get that right, and then that follows on. No, we've agreed standards here. Let's work to these standards. Uh, and again, you work hand in hand with the NHBC. You go on site, you look at their book and see if they're picking up any faults. And when you're there, you'll maybe say, oh, they've had a wee issue with um, this situation. You'll go in specific. If you're going to look at a house, you might look at that specifically. The NHBC don't do drain testing. They rely on the local authorities. So there's a partnership there already. There is a partnership there already between all these people um, to, to try and, at the end of the day, professional people all wanting to get a professional, good quality building. 
absolutely, that, that's the point well made. Mr Stewart, very patient. Uh, thank you for sticking with us. Uh, Alexander Stewart, MSP. Uh, thank you, convener. Gentlemen, we've already touched this morning on the role of building standards, uh, and it would be quite useful to get a view from you about how local authority building standards departments themselves are sufficiently resourced to provide an effective service to the client. And if that's not the case, what kind of knock-on effect do we then have? So, Mr Campbell, you were starting to come on to some of that. <laughs> so. I, th I think you, you'll always have um, a local authority view saying that we're, you know, the, 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 the service is understaffed. Um, it, it's a particular issue right now where in the last, you know, that we're, we're slowly coming out of a recession. Uh, house building is now, you know, t taken off again. Uh, there are levels of housing that we are now approaching that we weren't, we, we, were, we last seen at the boom. Um, unfortunately, local authorities haven't kept in tow with that. Um, and the result is now that many authorities are, are struggling with st staff resources, trying to catch up with the, the, the kind of private sector. Um, Highland Council in itself, uh, when we have issues of staff resources that we're, we're unable to, to turn around the, the building want applications uh, to meet targets, we regularly will use uh, the assistance of private sector uh, verifiers, surveyors to help us. Um, and I'm aware that uh, Edinburgh uh, fairly recently uh, put out a plea to labs uh, for, that, for that same purpose. So yes, you know, as I say, we will we'll always plead that we don't have enough staff, um, and it, it is an issue. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think there's a serious issue with um, local authority funding of building standards. It isn't ring fenced. The the fees aren't ring fenced, and I think some. I'm speaking on behalf of ISS, so I can say <laughs> that I think the perception is that some local authorities see building standards as a bit of a cash cow, that there's a regular income coming in here that we can have some of this and it isn't properly resourced. I think there was a recession. Building industry seems to go up and down through recessions. I've been involved for 40 years and I can probably name most of them. And at that time, Yes, there is financial pressures on the department to actually have enough income to cover your budget and your staff. But when it's out of that very dip, there's normally a surplus and it isn't always getting spent on resources. You have all sorts of further complications of colleges stop doing surveying courses because they're not, there's no recruitment for surveyors. That takes four years to fix. So you come out of a recession and you need someone there, but you're, 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 that person's in training. Because of the budgetary situation, local authorities, they tend to have yearly budgets and they don't do long-term succession planning. Training regimes and apprentice regimes are, are difficult. And I think the RICS have been looking at trying to somehow help in that way. And there's other professional bodies as well to, to work with local authorities, um, to, to work at training and maybe modern apprentice and, and try and get more professional people into building standards. Because I think, as Gilly said as well, I think it's quite important to have professional people with professional standards because that institute gives you that assurance that a member is working to a professional standard, whereas perhaps someone who's not qualified, not saying they've not got level of expertise, but sometimes they've not got that professional standard behind them. And, uh, but I think there's certainly issues with training, there's issues with budgetary control, and I think also there's huge issues with the fact that still a huge percentage of building one applications that come into a council, the fees are probably less than £250. And that will hardly cover the administration nowadays with computer systems and registering things. Never mind the technical input into it. Just the, grant, just the register of a want and grant the want and the process that that's involved in and leasing computer space uh, off the e-building standard systems and others. Um, that, that, that alone, that's that money wiped out and then you've got to do a professional um, a job on top of that. The, the, the fees at the lower end need to be greatly increased um, you could maybe look at cutting down on some of the non-domestic fees because I think, again, 
We're speaking primarily today about house building. 400 unit housing scheme may cost quite a few million pounds, say 20 million pound. A 20 million pound office development perhaps can be thoroughly inspected um, if it's a fairly sort of shell unit and about half a dozen inspections. You could do half a dozen inspections times 400 on the housing scheme and it's the same fee. So there's different fee structure has to be looked at. I think up, up to the bottom, could perhaps be cut back a bit at the top, but I think domestic, non-domestic has to be maybe looked at separately and maybe be a wee bit more more clever there. And also, it's very difficult, but I know that certainly my view is that any monies that comes into building standards should be um, kept within that that team as such, that budget. I think that's very clear, Mr McKenzie, and very helpful. <coughs> Mr Campbell, did you want to come back in? Can I just just uh, support what... what what Kenny's saying, succession management is an issue that seems to have fallen off a lot of local authorities' radar. Um, the, and to the extent that, the, you know, apprentices, trainee surveyors are, are a th seem to be a thing of the past. Um, as an example, in, in my t I have a team of 26 staff. Um, <clears throat> the average age of my surveyors is, is 48 years old. Um, my, I've got two surveyors at 65. Uh, my youngest surveyor is 30 years old, and I'm not getting to be, you know, to 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 be taking in uh, trainee people to 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 shore up the bottom end of of the profession. We're, and I think this is this is happening throughout the the, the country. We've got a lot of old their surveyors um, that and you know within the next five or ten years could believe in the profession and we don't have young new blood uh, you know th th that's growing in underneath that and it's it's a potential problem the problem we have there that funding is a major issue uh, and if we are to be realistic about where we're going forward then we need to look at the fee process and the structure of that because that will give us an opportunity to identify and move things forward and then you've exactly touched on mr campbell about the whole idea about apprenticeships uh, about ensuring that you've got uh, progression uh, that there is uh, Colleges, universities are supporting that process as well because what we're going to find as we move forward over the next five or ten years uh, is that but there is going to be a massive demand uh, and then people will be trying to acquire these individuals into locations uh, to try and ensure that they have that. And as more house building demand grows and progresses, uh, you're going to find yourself in a very difficult situation of being able to manage that crisis because it will become a crisis. Uh, and then there could be more difficulties and more standards that are slipping because you don't have the fully qualified staff to manage that process and ensure that you have the right people doing the right rules in the community. Uh, and the house buyer uh, buying the property assumes that everything is going to be okay uh, because they, they have this idea uh, that their, uh, their new home uh, or the house they're purchasing, uh, the biggest purchase of their life maybe, uh, is going to be of a good standard and that may not be the case. I'm just wondering, wrapped within that, I think, was the point that Mr. Campbell had making about where the skills gap might emerge in, in the years ahead. So I think it would be helpful if you could put on the record how you would seek to address that skills gap. Obviously, you've spoken about a resourcing issue, about ring fencing and adequately resourcing and full cost recovery in terms of the level of fees. But that wouldn't solve the skills gap. So it might seem self-evident to you how we solve that skills gap, but it would be quite helpful for our committee if you were to put some of that on the record here this morning. Mr Campbell. Uh, the, the, the fees um, consultation that came out just before Christmas um, or just at the turn of the year, one of the, the kind of recommendations of that was that the fee increase, you know, part of that fee increase to the local authorities would require the local authorities to employ trainees, apprenticeships. Um, and that's an excellent idea. I personally think, you know, would fully support that. It, I, I would ask, or my question to you is how you could make the local authorities adhere to that, because it's an excellent idea and it would hopefully force the local or commit the local authorities to 
employing new blood within the profession. But I find that, you know, like the, the ring fencing fee income um, is a great idea, and I don't think you would have any building standards manager in the country say no to it, but it's an impossible task to have a local authority give money that goes into a central pot to an individual service. Can, if, I, if you could answer that question, we should be swapping places with each other because any <laughs> politician that, that tackles the problem you've identified, every other politician accuses them of centralisation and uh, undermining local democracy. Mm -hmm. But of course, sometimes that means at a local level we're not getting the service and delivery that, that all of our constituents require. And we all, we all wrestle with that one, but we'll, we'll certainly continue to think about that, Mr Mackenzie. Briefly, I, I think going back, and again, it, it, I think not undermining Gillian and Clarker Works, but I think Clarker Works and building standards have always been separate. But what we did have for many years certainly was what we called more a building inspector who was a Clarker Works as such. And they were much more the people who were out five days a week going round inspecting work. And you had your building inspector, surveyor, officer, whatever the titles change over the years. We've gone from building control to building standards, <coughs> quite rightly, because we never did control buildings as such. But that, that now it's very much getting it right on the plans and then inspecting. I think in the past, we quite often, we got it right in the plans, but it wasn't as involved because there wasn't as many regulations and complications. Building was much simpler 40 years ago. And at that time, it was very much get out and see it on site. And I think it has moved away from that. And I think local authorities, particularly when the construction compliance notification plan came in, looked at employing more site-based people. Maybe more, ex we've got experienced people in the office, but maybe some youngsters to come in and train to learn the skills of site inspection and plan reporting and the disciplines of the, the profession as such, but maybe employ clerk work type people to only do site inspection work. But again, that floundered a bit on one, availability, and two, um, actual finance of, of that, the resourcing of it. And, and I think there is a will within um, local authorities to, to do both, but it's, it's all down to, as you were saying, getting someone at the very top to authorise it when budgets are incredibly tight, whether it's in national or local. Okay. Mr Carr, did you want to come in? Yeah, and I can already strengthen what Mr McKenzie is saying. Um, my own personal situation, I worked 10 years in the Channel Islands. There was a um, post advertised for a clerk of works for the education department. 233 applicants for one post, um, which I thought was a very good number of people that Employee. Luckily, luckily enough, I won that. And it was, again, ongoing training from the Guernsey government um, that, strength, I believe, strengthened my career. My own situation on the qualifications part of it, I went to university when I was 43. As I say, I'm a joiner background. I wanted to improve my career through, throughout my life. So I went, I had a full-time family, full-time job and a part-time degree. So it's only the individuals that you can bring into the construction. It's not all about pe taking people directly from college or university. It's people with experience. It's, you, you don't need to know just how you build things. You need to know how we don't build things. And that's only learned by experience. It's, sorry, one other. Um, we are now called Institute of Clark of Works and Construction Inspectorate. We're not just Clark of Works anymore. In, in our own body, we recognized that to keep, to maintain, you know, 100 and odd year old, Institute would need to improve, so we are construct, construction inspectors as well. I think we know that, but we all fall back into the old terminology, and I apologise yeah. for that. Mr McKay, I apologise. Were you wanting to come in any of that? Did you caught my eye just, I mean, This is not really a, a legal issue mm -hmm. uh, as such, but I entirely endorse what the, my colleagues in the panel are saying here. Um, we, we tend to forget that we've been talking about new built houses uh, today, but building uh, standards departments deal with a huge range of applications on a daily basis. And certainly what we're seeing certainly in Edinburgh is a big backlog now. Uh, it's not affecting buyers, but lots of homeowners are being affected because of the backlog. People who want to get you know, an extension added, work done in their house of some shape or form, and it's being held back. 
which uh, as an overall issue is not good. It's not good for the building industry. It's not good for homeowners. And uh, again, it come back to resources. Uh, because we, you know, building standards is an essential part of what we do. Uh, and as you know, in the consumers, that we know that uh, the work is being regulated and checked to a reasonable standard. Okay, thank you, uh, Alexander Stewart. Was your initial question? Do you want to follow up on any of that? Uh, just to, to thank them, convener, because I think you know the evidence that we've heard and that what you've said exactly mirrors what we, I think, believe the case to be. Uh, that, as I said, there is a backlog. Uh, there is a, a potential uh, crisis within the industry in in the future. Uh, and I think that you know you've identified things that should and could be done uh, to address that. Uh, and I think they, they're, they're very useful uh, for us here at the committee as we go forward. So thank you for that. Thank you. Kenny. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Stewart. Um, just say to other members, we've got about ten minutes more left for questions. If there's anything you still want to come back in on, I know Mr. Simpson does. So Graham Simpson. Thanks very much. Um, so uh, I mean, our role really is to you know, look look at the system which we've done. We've heard some very good evidence uh, the previous session and today, and to uh, come up with some uh, solutions. Um, if I can ask you, M Mr. McKenzie, in your uh, submission, the submission from the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, um, and for members, this is on page five of their submission. You mentioned that the system can result in a lack of consistency within each building standards office. This is point 15, uh, and more widely across Scotland. And the in you say the introduction of procedural regulations would help alleviate this. Um, do, you, do you think, therefore, uh, that uh, we should set a, a minimum number uh, of inspections to be carried out by building control uh, and possibly warranty providers? Yeah, I think that, that in effect happens at the moment. I think where the inconsistency comes in is how we populate. We, we've got a, a, this construction compliance notification system in place now uh, and that can be populated to 20 visits perhaps I think or more you could add more uh, and obviously that that's very very rare uh, it also asks for um, certification as well where and, and, we, and we give a, a tick sheet of all the final certification we require as well so it's a guidance note as well which is, is, is very useful for contractors but I think there's an inconsistency because as Ross has alluded to and, and where I currently work in Edinburgh, we, we have been struggling uh, with workload because Edinburgh's booming, it's a capital city and it, it's been booming. It never really had much of a recession. It, it, it rode out the recession pretty well compared to other places. And we have actually used the facilities that we have now with consortia through the local authorities and as a national body, local authority building standards, which would always, well, the local authorities are always there anyway. And we've outsourced work to Aberdeen and to Argyll and Butte, who Aberdeen, because of the oil industry, I think, have suffered a recession. So they have had spare capacity and they've been helping us out, which has improved the situation. But there still is this inconsistency um, that perhaps some officer may have a lot of experience and look at an application and say, oh, yeah, and I know that architect and he'll be supervising the work. I'll only do three visits there. I'll only look at the beginning, the middle and the end. And then you might get a slightly more inexperienced officer who may say, oh, I want to see quite a lot. And then you might get an officer who's got a huge backlog saying, I'll just risk assess this one. I'll ask for photographs. That's a type of inconsistency. So it, it already in place, the fact that there is almost a, a procedural thing there where there is a document that can be sent out it's maybe down just the personality and experience of how that inconsistency has come about. It's the same with interpretation of regulations. Developers are always say people interpret differently, but every architect and every developer gives you different levels of information. And also people have a different, different degree of expertise and what they can glean from perhaps a few notes. They want a detail, they want different things. You're never ever with, with personality going to get something totally ticked in, in boxes. It'll always vary a little bit depending 
and things. But procedurally, I think to perhaps enforce, I think the construction notification plan is very much a voluntary thing for local authorities. I think in England and Wales, perhaps, uh, they had a system, I don't know if it was a national system, way back that they wanted to look at things. This was way back when I started building standards <laughs> and some authorities adopted have adopted that in the past. <coughs> Again, it's re resource-based. When you're quiet, you can get things done. Uh, Mr McKenzie, yeah, I think we're, we're, we've established, um, we know from, from evidence that we've heard that different councils perform at different levels uh, and that's why the Scottish Government uh, in issuing uh, the verification notices to councils have given some only one year uh, and some up to six. I think at the top of my head, Edinburgh got one year. Yeah, so um, so you're right. Uh, different councils are performing to different standards. Um, but from our point of view, uh, the evidence that we've heard uh, is that when it, com when it comes to buying a house, you ha can have no confidence that that house uh, has been inspected at every stage. You can have no confidence uh, that it is built to standards. Um, and what I'm suggesting is that if we build into the system a prescribed number of inspections, that that situation may not arise. So my question is to any of you, would you agree with that? I think it would certainly help if it was resourced. Uh, it would almost certainly help. But I think perhaps as you alluded to earlier, I, my gut feeling is that there still would be the odd situation occurring. And, and I think these situations have occurred anyway with, with a good level of supervision in place. I, I, I'm not sure. I think, as Ross said, building standards isn't just about new housing. And I would say in Edinburgh, at the moment, not trying to defend it in any way, perhaps some of the backlog has been caused because there's been a huge upsurge in new housing and new housing gets very well served in terms of <clears throat> people needing to get a certificate on a day and people out doing inspections and doing professional thorough inspections as best of their ability. Uh, and that demand has taken away from resources which have probably focused quite a lot in new housing in, in recent times because it does tend to get quite high priority. It certainly would be a big advantage if there was a fee for new housing that allowed officers to inspect key stages in every single house, definitely improvement. But I think, as, as Gilly said as well, you can't guarantee that you'll see every bit, that, that you're only there, even if you're there every day, or twice a day, there's a lot done in three hours that you're not there that you might, you might never see and might be missed. And that might be when the dodgy wall ties put up because I've run out of wall ties and thought, oh, we need to, we're getting paid a bonus for this or we need to get this finished. We'll go and pick up something else and use it. And my view is, and I think it was in the, the Clarker Works um, Institute's re report, is a lot of the issues goes back to the tradesmen I'm not trying to uh, divert that from the professionals supervising and designing and constructing, but it's the man on the ground who's making that error. It's that qualified tradesman. And I think that has to be looked at is who are we employing? Are we employing four-year, five-year time-served tradesmen anymore? I'm totally digressing, but I, um, if you want my personal view on things, I think that's where a lot of the fault has come about. Yes, supervision maybe should have picked some of it up, it can't pick up and up. You can't afford to have someone stand over somebody's shoulder. And that's literally a factory situation, what you've got, a level of quality control. I think about a uh, long-term security for tradesmen with certain companies rather than subbing everything in yeah, well, that's individual. The yeah. The schemes and all yeah. about you know, people, as Gilly says, mm -hmm. being in one site one day, taking the money and going to another site the next day, no responsibility, no comeback. Folk probably don't even know who built walls anymore. Mm -hmm. I There's think Gilly Carr wanted to add some of that as well. Actually, mate, was going to be a very similar answer to your question. Yes. Your question was, will it improve? And I was just going to say yes. <laughs> That's far too short an answer. You'll, you'll never yeah. go far in politics with a short, clear answer like that, Mr Campbell. Say, 
qualified, yes. In principle, in <laughs> politics, Mr. Campbell. In principle, what you're suggesting, <laughs> <laughs> uh, suggesting is, is is would work. Um, but the the the, the construction compliance notification system, <coughs> excuse me, addresses that to a certain extent, and it targets, it risks risk assesses. The, the individual site, the developer, uh, you know, the, 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 the location of the site, the, the uh, ground conditions, etc. Um, and the surveyor will then determine the, the number of inspections that's required. To have every individual house on a site um, inspected at various stages of construction would require a huge resource. Um, and that's fine when you've got 200 houses to do uh, that's the, for the next two years, but when that de housing development then dries up, you know, and there's no housing for the next two or three years after that, what does the local authority do with that resource? Uh, you know, it, it, there's issues there with employing and, and you know hiring and firing. If you know crudely, um, the, the 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 local authority c couldn't manage very well. I don't think. But in principle, yes, I think you know what you're suggesting uh, is a, is a good idea. Mr. Simpson, anything else? No. Okay, Elaine Smith. Thanks very much, Convener. It's just a, a specific question to Gilly Carr, and it's back to the Clackwatch situation. In your um, in your written submission to us, you say at number five. Um, historically, regulation stipulated the appointment of a Clackwatch. So this should be reinstated. What regulations were those? It should have read um, forms of contract, not regulations. Forms of contract. So yeah. can you explain that a bit further then? Forms of contract yeah, with the builders or with the local authorities? Or? Forms of contract between builders and um, clients, whether they be a private client or a local authority. As I touched on before, the um, design, and, design and build form of contract came about and um, the local authority without quantities or with quantities kind of went astride. There was sections within them earlier contracts that stipulated A23 of mind in the um, in the forms of contract that actually stated stated what what the contractor had to provide for the clockworks, like an office and a telephone, etc. When the design and build come, come along, which was um, pushed by the the construction companies themselves, the word clockworks didn't exist anymore. So it would. Can I specify then, rather than talking about maybe housing developments, mm -hmm. what we're talking about here is local authorities employing, uh, contracting with private companies to build schools. Yeah. And, yeah. and in previous times, those schools would have had a clerk of work stipulated in the contract, but now that they're not. Yeah. When it's stipulated in the, in the, in the contract, it's up to the person who's signing up to the contract, i.e. the architect or the, the head of local authority, they can at least remove the word clock of works if they don't want clock of works there. When it went to the design and build form of contract, with the word clock of works not being in there, we seem to be forgotten. Right, and those contracts, um, they're legal? Yep. So they could be looked at. Um, so basically yeah. the committee could take an interest in that. And it, I'm not f from a legal background, but my understanding is the um, current forms of contract that are coming out in the construction industry are called NEC3. And I, I think there's a big push from RICS to get the word cl words clock of works put back into the into the contract, um, which is very helpful. But it, until we get recognised that there's a need, and as um, Mr Simpson put on, you know, you, you need to have a... There needs to be something right to say. You need X amount of um, inspections, whether it be a building inspector, chartered surveyor, clock of works. It's, um, it's a way forward. Right. I don't know if Mr Mackay has any comment on that. No, the, the, like all your lives, there are standard form contracts and there are a whole suite of contracts in the building industry which have uh, been developed over the years, um, you do, which architects and others pull down off the shelf and, and effectively fill in the blanks uh, to a large degree. Uh, no, they regulate the, uh, the time scale, the payment structure, etc., etc. And the, these are the standard form contracts I think Gilly's alluding to, that you know the the, uh, the architect who's putting the whole scheme together would be using, 
and uh, certainly if the it'd be a question of going to, I suspect, the RIAS or other similar body looking to them to develop these standard form construction contracts to uh, not perhaps enforce, but certainly looked for the um, inspection regime to be beefed up in that regard, whether it's a local authority client, a private client or whatever. It seems from what Gally Clark is saying that actually it did used to be enforced because it was part of the legal document. And now it no longer is. Yeah, it's not my sector, but I can imagine that, yes, they've, they've dropped that. It was a matter of practice. Right. And, uh, but it's equally as, as simple putting it back in again. And it's a question of uh, speaking to the relevant parties who prepare these standard form contracts and recommending right. that this would be good practice. Can I, can I just come in there? Uh, again, I'm, I'm not wanting to digress, but are we talking here about private house, speculative house building? Are we talking about local authority house building are we talking about building because I worked for a house building contractor 40 years ago and there was never a clack of works ever on a private house building job there never ever was one local authority house building which is now done through housing association still tends to have clack of works on them um, very few uh, jobs that aren't university or Health board or something like that have clerk works now. Most major contracts are um, design build. Architects design them for a client. They appoint then a major contractor, and the contractor I don't know the legal word, but he brings on board all the architects and engineers, um, and they come under his remit. After that point, he employs them all, and the the, the job's done. He may there may be a third party surveyor or architect or project manager on behalf of the client looking after the project. But I think ultimately the, the contract is with, the, with, the, with that builder at the end of the day. I mean, I think that's quite helpful because it was exactly what I was trying to clarify, but I think we did clarify mm. that actually what was being referred to was beyond... I mean, we have tended to focus on private house mm -hmm. building, mm -hmm. but there is a lot more to of the course, whole regime yeah. and the inspection regime yeah. than that. So I think what that widens out to is that what we were talking about is schools, hospitals, Scottish parliaments, you yeah. know, that the, perhaps where the, pri the, the public sector is employing the private sector on a d design, build, construct. It seems to me from the answer I got to the question that it used to be that you would be confident that you would have to have a clerk of works that be on the contract, but now it doesn't have to be. And so therefore you can have schools put up in areas as part of the design builds construct um which don't have a clack of watch near them i think that that's what i was trying to if clarify it's design build you, you have schools now in edinburgh which have been built under a package under a, a ppi of whatever pp2 or whatever it is that don't have clack of works or may have a clack of works but you've got now schools that the, the councils are funding through architects again and, and tender to builders who do have clerk of works um, and probably more have got clerk of works visiting again because we tend to be reactive rather than proactive because walls have been falling down. I'm sorry to maybe finish with something for me, I don't know if we're finished, but for me something slightly related, but it's on, um, <coughs> on a briefing that we had for the meeting and it talks about um, functional standards and it gives specifically standard 2.2 which says that every building divided into more than one area of different occupation must be designed and constructed in such a way that in the event of an outbreak of fire within the building, fire and smoke are inhibited from spreading beyond the area of occupation where the fire originated. Now, that then illustrates how the, the building should perform, um, but it doesn't tell you how that requirement should be achieved. And presumably, because the, uh, the, the choice is with the... <coughs> Although the building standards mandatory, the choice is with the builder how they would achieve that. Then how how can the local authority verify, and maybe this is a question for Mr Campbell, how can they actually know that that is achieved if they don't inspect? Again, coming back to risk assessing the specific types of buildings, um, if we're looking at that particular stand regulation that you're referring to there, um, and Highland Council's point, uh, uh, situation, and I'm sure most authorities would, 
given that it's a, a, a health and safety issue, we would inspect that, that specific part of the building. Um, but you're referring to the, the, the regulation there. Underneath that regulation, there's a, there's a ream of technical standards that will determine various ways of complying with that standard. Uh, sorry, with that regulation, the designer, the architect, uh, can either opt to um, adhere to the the standards, um, or they, they, they can come up with uh, you know a, an alternative to that. But in essence, it always has to come back that it that it must comply. And in every, as I say, in uh, certainly Highland Council's uh, situation, we would inspect to check separating floors or, or compartment floors or whatever it might be to ensure that that integrity is met. Would that just be floors? Because I suppose what springs to my mind is open plan schools, for example. I, when, <laughs> when, you're, when you're opening up into build, you know, more complex types of buildings like that, the, there are other standards that, that come into place that, that would support uh, th that individual uh, Can I come into that, actually? The, the report on the schools, uh, which I wasn't totally directly involved in, but my colleague was very involved in in Edinburgh, there was a lot of questions raised about open plan schools and a lot of questions raised about fire separating walls and things like that. We're not convinced they were fire separating walls. Uh, you can have compartment sizes of thousands of metres, particularly in single storey schools and such like. Go back to your first question. That it, 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 we do inspect these walls and floors. And the biggest thing is you want to inspect is the penetrations to make sure the fire stopped, there's dampers and things and different things and anything going through those floors. So that is critical and is a, a key inspection point. But I think in the school's report, it kept alluding to fire stopping if it was wrong. And we think these were maybe just acoustic walls that were taken up and they double thick plastic thickness plasterboard on them for sound. How could they get through without an inspection then? But and I don't mean just in Edinburgh, I'm just talking about in, gen in general, oh, no, in the whole of Scotland, if you're well, not actually inspect, you know, if you don't have a, an inspection regime that inspects all of these individually and you just depend on builders to say, tick, no, no, we've complied. No, no, I think, I think we would inspect those things. But if, if, if I was looking at a wall that was an acoustic wall to me and someone else perceives it as being a firewall later, um, when they do a report on a building, if it's an acoustic wall and it's got a hole through it, it's not sound. I don't want to get too technical and too defensive here, but sound doesn't come into schools in terms of our building standards. It only comes into housing and relationships with buildings between housing and hotels nowadays, residential sleeping things. Um, so there was a lot of put things put into these school reports talking about breaches and firewalls that I don't think were... We're not 100% sure because we didn't get specific instances. But normally, firewalls are inspected. It's one of the key areas. People say we're obsessed by fire. We tend to be labelled to be obsessed with drainage and fire. Uh, and other people say, well, what about condensation? What about dampness? What if my roof leaks? That's more, much more important than my building ever going on fire. Uh, but we do tend to look at the health and safety things quite critically access another thing nowadays that we're, we're, we're very strict on but certainly firewalls would always be inspected uh, things two things can happen is one after the building's finished people can go in and start putting IT throughout that building and the IT person goes in and he takes his knife and he cuts through a fire bat or a fire partition and just leaves it and doesn't fire stop it later that doesn't need a building warrant. Nobody goes back in and, and inspects that. So these things happen regularly. I've been in buildings where I've been resident on that building for four years, and you turn your back, and it's an area it's meant to be locked down, permit only from the contractor to get in, and suddenly you turn your back, and two months later, there's a ladder up, and somebody, and you're saying, how's this happening? And you go back to them, they say, oh, that's, that's not us, that's um, somebody from BT putting something in. Ah, but it is you, it's your building still. You've got to look after these things. And it, it comes down sometimes to management. I think a lot, though, in the schools, that a lot of the walls that were perceived to be firewalls were actually just acoustic walls <laughs> for keeping quiet between classrooms. Because you wouldn't need, in a lot of schools, you wouldn't need many fire-separating walls. 
and they're all in one occupancy, they're all open plan. Even your, your floors don't perhaps need to be um, firewalls. Sorry to I, no, go on to it, but it no, is no, quite, it's no, but quite a critical thing and part the, of that report. The only reason I'm stopping at this point, I didn't yeah. want to stop you earlier, yeah. Yeah. Um, because we should let you put all Aye, of this on yeah. the record, but the Education Committee of the Scottish Parliament's got an inquiry that starts today, actually, at their committee into school infrastructure. We're looking at many of these matters, so I'm not trying to curtail no, no. the no, detail no. you're putting on no, the record. No, no, I think it's appropriate to, to mention that another committee of this parliament's looking sure, in quite sure. a lot of detail. No, that's fine. The, and it, it's, school it's worthwhile just determining what yeah. what think standards are, because building control officers, if we, we, we historically, if we've asked things, the biggest thing we ever get back from builders is, that's not a building regulation. We don't have to do that. We, you might say it's good building practice, but if it's if it's just something like the difference between there might be a wee bit of sounds transmitted between two offices, they're not going to do it. They're not going to spend money in fire stopping something. They're just going to leave that. It's a it's a non. It doesn't matter to anybody. And I think my colleague felt that a lot of the stuff that came back on the schools about fire he couldn't understand and he didn't see where all these things were and we couldn't understand where they were but we weren't given specifics but we we had we reckon that it's because schools tend to have acoustics around the corridors around every room which looks like a firewall but it, it, it isn't and it might be an interesting thing to put to your committee mm. okay thank you for really up any that okay any other questions from committee members uh, can I thank all of you for, we've had good value of you today, that, that's a lengthy evidence session. I think it's reasonable to put on the record right where we started that there's, there's, there's lots of players in, in making building standards as high a quality and buildings as safe as they possibly can be. When things go wrong, it is anecdotal and most people have very good experiences of, of the system, but we're obviously looking about what the recourse is and how we stop things going wrong and where responsibility sits in relation to that. It's not always clear where responsibility does sit. I think Mr Mackay quite helpfully uh, illustrated that point when you were giving it from a legal perspective, but very informative, very helpful, a lot for us to digest as a committee, I think. Uh, can I thank you all again for your attendance? We'll keep you updated with our inquiry as we go forward, but that ends this particular evidence session and we move into private session.